Welcome to Highland Waves, a podcast coming to you from Marshbrook Studios, located beside the world-renowned Marguerite River in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Canada. Highland Waves features stories about the people, the places, and the visitors of Inverness County. I'm Pat Wall, host of Highland Waves. Today in studio with me is Mr. Clive Doucette, urban anthropologist, former four-term Ottawa City Councillor, award-winning writer of books, poetry, plays, and a beekeeper here in Inverness County at Grandy Tank. Welcome to Highland Waves, Clive. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. You're very welcome. You're a man of many talents, and we'll try and keep it uh, within the 30 minutes allotted here. You were born in London, England. Yeah, I was. Yeah. And since your ancestors are Acadian, how did that come about? Well, like, a, I guess, many thousands of others, my dad was in the RCAF uh, in, during the war, and he met a wonderful uh, young woman in England, uh, London, uh, Catherine Oliver, and they fell in love, and at the end of the war, they got married, and uh, uh, at the time, she was foolish enough to say to the immigration people that, were, that she was pregnant, and in those days you weren't allowed to cross the ocean. Pregnant ladies weren't allowed to cross the ocean. So she was obliged to stay an extra six months to where I would, to have me where I was born in, in London. And then she got on the boat and, and came to uh, the famous Pier 21 in, in Halifax. Oh, great. <laughs> Good story. Yeah. Yeah. What was your path to Canada and becoming a counselor in that capital city of Ottawa? Well, Ottawa is really my hometown and uh, where I lived most of my life. And uh, I was an I studied urban anthropology at the University of Montreal in Toronto, and uh, they were always my passion. And uh, I probably got involved with Jane Jacobs back when I was like 20 in, in Toronto, and uh, I, to stop the Spadina Expressway, which which amazingly we we did. It was it was the largest kind of social uprising that, that 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 probably North America has ever seen, and one of the very few urban freeways that was stopped. So that was. Uh, that was my introduction to, to city politics and the importance of civic action. And then um, many years later in Ottawa, guess what? They were doing the same thing. They were proposing a, 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 the Bronson Expressway right through my neighborhood. Now, now I was a grown man, you know, children of my own, and, uh, and uh, it just seemed to be the wrong thing to do in every way, just like the Spadina was. And there was, we noticed there was a, a rail line, an old unused freight line, parallel to Bronson. And so some of my friends said, hey, why don't we just activate this line, get, a, get a, an urban transit uh, rail, rail line going, and instead of building this monstrous highway and expropriating people and, and, and polluting the, the whole center of the city. And uh, so I, I, I was active in that, and people asked me to run for, for city council to represent the area. I did, and, and to everyone's surprise, I won. Why did you get involved in politics in the first place? Well, I, I think I never wanted or had any ambition to be a politician, but I certainly cared about cities and in the environment and sustainability. And I, and I saw uh, cities going in the absolute wrong direction, sprawling out further and further, investing more and more in, in big highways. And, and uh, it, it's, it suddenly realized that city, the city level of politics had a huge impact on that. So once I realized that, I thought instead of working for, which I did for the Ministry of State for Urban Affairs and for Municipal Affairs for the pro province of Ontario, I decided that, that, that maybe the place I should be was in city politics, and it turned out to be exactly right. After your time in politics, do you feel that you left the people who you represented better off than before you went in? Uh, I, I do. I think I, think I did. Uh, um, we brought in a lot of really interesting little things, especially you know, docks for small boats along the Rideau Canal, um, the Rideau River, uh, um, more more trees in the neighborhood, better intersections, uh, safer intersections, 
um, and uh, uh, slower speeds in, 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 in urban neighborhoods. There were, uh, all kinds of small things, different standards for sidewalks, wider sidewalks. Uh, what I didn't succeed at doing, and also the light rail, we were successful in bringing in the light rail project instead of building the, the Bronson Expressway, which was a big success from day one, big, big ridership. But I didn't really succeed as getting people to change their vision. I eventually ran for mayor, and, uh, and I was quite popular as a city councillor. But at the, at the mayor's level, which includes vast suburban areas in, 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 in Ottawa, I just couldn't turn, turn the corner. So I would say I would give myself a mixed report, I think. What was the highlight of your career in politics? Uh, oh gosh, there were many. I think the winning the first time was was amazing. Uh, uh, no, no one, no one sort of of the left environmental side had ever won in the Senate, Senate city before. I was the first, and no, no one expected me to win, and I won by a thousand votes, which uh, which really blew everybody away and me. I remember rolling out of bed. Uh, the morning after the election, and uh, my wife said, "Where are you going, Clive?" And I said, oh, "I'm going to, you know, to street corner to meet people on street corners." And she said, "Clive, you won. It's over." <laughs> <laughs> As a politician, you meet a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, what politician have you met that has made an impression on you? I, I think Mayor Shirelli, the mayor I worked with, he was a very modest man, uh, a, a contract lawyer, uh, died in the world liberal, um, but he, he really not just cared about the city, but he was very effective in mobilizing um, um, uh, uh, a majority on council. And often we worked really well together. And often for me, you know, he kind of used me as a kind of a hunting dog to kind of check out the woods. And, and, <laughs> and, and then when, I, when he, he realized that maybe I was right and he wasn't going to lose his seat if I, by backing me, he, he would. And uh, uh, in, on reflection, I think he was probably one of the very best mayors Otto ever had. I don't think people see him that way because because he was so modest and because his accomplishments have largely been destroyed by his successors. It seems to me, maybe it's me, but there seems to be a slide away from democracy in politics today. I, I think I think there is a frustration uh, uh, that um, that and people are expressing it by by not caring about politics. They don't I don't see politics as being effective. I, I don't either. Uh, I I agree with them. Uh, I I don't think voting for a dictator is the right, right way to go. But, but the, the, the thing is, they're right. Uh, in Ottawa, for example, it's, it's, the city is m controlled by very billionaire developers. Every important decision, with the exception of the Bronson Expressway probably, uh, uh, have been made by developers in the backroom deals. So, um, and it's not changed since I left at all. In fact, it's worse than ever. So uh, when, when, uh, when people, People talk, talk to people from home and they say, Clive, you're so lucky to be away from here and away from politics because you would find it so depressing. Do you have a message for those who want to get into politics? Um, believe in your principles. You know, in spite of the hurt, uh, really believe that what you're doing is, 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 is good and, and, and you're serving the people, not, not big money. Just the people. I know my heroes from the past are people like Moses Cody and Jimmy Tompkins and my father, uh, people who really cared about people and ha helping them to have the life they wanted. And that's a passion that's never, never extinguished in myself. And I would say to young people, don't let it extinguish in you. Don't, don't, don't take the easy route and say politics are all terrible. It's, it's a, politics are simply a reflection of the society that we're in. And the society we're in now is not great. It's mostly, uh, mostly unequal and unfair and uh, controlled by people who just want to make a lot of money. You now live in Grandy Tang. Yep. You're close to the location of your grandfather's house, which is the title of your most recent book. Yeah. And we'll talk about that later. You must see some incredible changes here since you were a child coming here to your grandfather's house. Oh, enormous. I mean, I really, I really sometimes feel like a very, very old man, which I guess I am. Uh, when I look at the 
when I was a little kid, like 11, 12, Grand Etang and St. Saint Saint Joseph Dumont and, and the Marguerite Valley, they were postcards, beautiful, small farms. They were producing, there was a producing society. We, we produced wheat, we produced oats, we produced, uh, maybe, maybe not wheat, but oats and, 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 and uh, all the things you need to live. And, you know, and my grandfather did himself. And all that society has basically collapsed. And the farms are now, 95% of them are gone back to scrub, bush, and bog. And uh, so I, I found it, for a long time, I found it so kind of depressing. I, I, I didn't want to come home. And then one day, I just sort of, not a long time ago now, like maybe 25, 25 years, I thought, no, no, it's home. I, should, I need to go home. And, uh, and that's when I, I started thinking about buying a place and, and, and maybe, uh, maybe I can't change the world, but I have eight acres and I, I work hard at having those little eight acres be the way my grandfather would like. It's, uh, there's certainly been big changes. Yeah. And uh, are they for the better, in your opinion? Uh, some of them are. Some of them are definitely for the better. Um, uh, the music and the, and the culture has, has really, really gone well. Uh, I think we're a much more open society now than we used to be. Uh, my mother was the first non-Catholic ever married into the Set family. And she was like an Amazon flower. No one could quite un understand, you know, English, uh, Protestant, ooh. Um, and, uh, um, and fortunately, that's, that's largely gone, which is great. And uh, people are more open to other cultures and other, other languages and so forth. Uh, that's the good side. The bad side is that we're 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 much like the cities. Uh, you know that we're controlled by big big money uh, and 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 uh, the kind of society that the, that I belong to as a, as a kid is largely not here. You know, if I want my grandchildren to come down and visit, um, they they can't take the milk out to the end of the road as I did for the for the dairy to go by and being. I learned a lot. I, uh, well, I didn't realize how much I ever learned. Uh, but when you, I, I just went with my grandfather from six o'clock in the morning to when I went to bed at night, 10, 10 o'clock at night. No, no kid does that anymore. No, it just, it's, they go to, my, my grandchildren go to camps <laughs> in the city. Uh, they can't imagine hanging out with anyone, for an old guy like me. For, for all. I never thought twice about it. My, my dad said when I was sort of 11, 12, she, he said, Grandpa, grandma's died. Uh, and grandpa's alone with him, with his sister. He needs some help. You 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 go down to Cape Breton and, and give him some help. And it never occurred to me to say, Dad, Dad, I'm not going to do that. I just said, Yeah. As a trained urban anthropologist, can you comment on the development that's taking place in Inverness County now? Uh, some of it's good, uh, and and I think the lack of um, Development controls on the on the on the on the shore and the prov provincial refusal to enact the uh, the uh, protection act uh, the shore protection act is terrible because what it means is I mean there's a house uh, built down from me it's it's like 30 feet from the edge of the cliff on a on a postage stamp and I guess what happens is the pump truck comes in it, it, there's no septic system. And it's, it's dangerous. And plus, people come to Cape Breton because it's got one thing that many other places on the planet don't, doesn't have. Not a lot of people with fabulous natural landscapes. So every time we chip away at that, you know, we, we, we hurt ourselves. We, we, wanna, we, should protect, we should protect those views in, a, in, a, in, a, in our natural world the way we, 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 we protect gold in our banks. It's that, it's that important. So... That part of it is, is but then, it, then it's the same as every other place. It's not, Ottawa is the same in, in that sense of, you know, money leading the, leading the dance, not, not, not the people or the world they live in, you know. I'm going to switch topics. You're a very successful writer. Thank you. Twelve books, four novels, four nonfiction, four books of poetry, a new one in progress, and five plays. What got you started in writing? Um, well, some kids are great at, at uh, playing the fiddle, 
and are amazing at it. Some kids are great at playing guitar. Uh, I, I was always really good at writing. I, it just came to me absolutely naturally. I, I think I had my first poem published when I was in grade five in Newfoundland. <laughs> in the school annual, I went to a uh, in this, they had a contest, and and and, that, and I, not that I, my mother just said you should enter this club, so I entered and I, and I won, and uh, and uh, but I, I never really set out to be a writer. I, I didn't have this thing. I am going to be the great Canadian writer. I just it's just something I did easily and well, and I, it was part of my life, you know. So I, I wouldn't define myself as so much as a writer as just a just a person, you know. Your book, My Grandfather's Cape Breton, was published in 1980. Mm. Still in print. Well, yeah. That's an accomplishment. It is. It's, it is an accomplishment. It's a wonderful thing to have 50 years later to have a book that you love uh, still in print. Most of my books are not in print anymore. Uh, they've, you know, you, the publishers go through an edition and then they, 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 they stop publishing. So it's, that's, I think it's, it's a, it's it is to Cape Breton what probably Anna Green Gables is to uh, to uh, PEI. It's a, it's a, it's just a very simple story of a young youngster getting to know his 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 grandparents and his relatives and and getting to have a little bit of confidence in their own ability to lead a useful life. Yeah. That's why you think it's so successful. I, I think so. Yeah, it just says people. Everyone is little once. Everyone have grant has a grand parent and everyone I think uh, loves Cape Breton because it's a great place to be. You write excerpts from your book of poetry for the local newspaper mm -hmm. and uh, therefore writing is never far away. No. So uh, where do you get your inspiration from? From life. Uh, I, I read a little column for the Oran called Talking to Bees which I never would have written in Ottawa in a gazillion years because uh, I would never have had bees. Uh, but but uh, I, I've learned being becoming a, an, a beekeeper is a great adventure, and bees are fascinating, fascinating creatures, and and that people have been talking to bees for many centuries. Uh, the, the, there's the tradition that uh, when somebody important in your family dies, and, and it came to the press's attention when the queen died, that the queen's beekeeper went and said, you know, the lady has died. And so, so it's a tradition that goes back, oh, probably many hundreds of years. And I didn't know that when I, but I, I just found sitting in my bee yard with the sun shining and the quiet buzz of the bees to be very, very calming and relaxing. And I started, it started me thinking differently. And, and so, so it's, Cape Breton has always been a great source of creativity for me and remains so to this day. Writing often is a lonely endeavor. Mm. Is it for you? I, I wouldn't say so uh, entirely. It, it's, it, it engages me with the world. It engages me with my neighborhood's neighbors and, and uh, engages me with life. Uh, it, so on one, the one hand, I would say not at all. On the other hand, it does a little. Because often people say, Clive, you're, you, you, don't have, you don't have a partner living in that big house all by yourself. I do, you know, what's, what's wrong with you? Well, you know, I, I have books and, and writing, and, and that to me is sort of like uh, Cicero once said, all a person needs is, is, is a, a, a library and a pen. And that's sort of the way I feel often. Okay. Your follow-up to the Grandfather's Cape Breton book is the grandfather's house. Yeah. And amongst the other stories in it, you chronicle your transition from grandchild to the grandfather. What are your father's grandchild memories? Oh my gosh, I've got so many. Um, Just briefly. Yeah. Kids used to sleep at our house on the weekend at, at night, uh, off every second weekend, and that was always fun. Watching Harry Potter with my, with my grandson, Felix, uh, Great, great eating popcorn, watching Harry Potter was great, uh, and uh, going for walks, slides, just all the sm simple things of, of life. Now, a grandfather yourself, how do you feel life in between has affected how you act as a grandfather? Um, it's it's made me much more, um, I guess, humble and cautious about my own 
capacity to be right about anything. <laughs> and and uh, so I, it's, it's, I, I, I uh, just, it, it's, it's made relating, I think, to people, uh, relating, to my, relating to my grandchildren and people to be much easier. Okay. What, in your opinion, are the greatest qualities of a grandfather? Just love. Be a good swimmer? Swimmer is, <laughs> is yeah, if you're taking your kids to the beach, it's good if you can swim. <laughs> Do you feel in society in general that it's beneficial to the younger generation or becoming more beneficial to them? To, to what? Uh, is society moving in the direction that you feel the younger society would like to attain to? Ah, in some ways, yes. Uh, I, I, I love the fact that I think we're moving towards an, an, an idea that we are a human species first and not uh, a Frenchman or a, or a Jew or a, a Muslim. We're, we're people first, and, and, and that's what we are. And I was an anthropology, it's a study of humanity, not the study of one person, one group, or one... And, and I think... Facebook and, and the internet has, has made people capable of thinking about someone sitting far, far away uh, as, as like them. And that's great. Uh, the bad thing is, I think, uh, w we haven't learned how to govern ourselves differently than locusts do. If we could govern ourselves like bees, we'd be okay. But basically, we're, we, we, we still trash everything we see as fast as we can for the biggest profit as we can, no matter what it is, whether it's people or gold or oil. And I think that's, uh, that's the biggest step we have to make. How do we translate this feeling of common humanity into common sustaining societies? You spoke of bees. You are a beekeeper. Mm. What got you started in beekeeping? Uh, romance. I just it seemed to be so romantic to be living in the country and have some hives and uh uh and it did turn out to be that way it's it's a very romantic endeavor uh and uh so maybe even a book somewhere books about bee clad glades by poets and stuff and yeah it's uh it's a no, nothing practical at all it comes through in your writing about the bees, that your yeah. love of bees oh, is, yeah. is I, there. I yeah. do. I do yeah. love them. And what does it do for you? Well, I get some honey. Uh, I, so far, I've, uh, I've, they've survived every Cape Breton winter, uh, and, uh, except for one. I have one hive went down this, this year. Uh, and the, the honey is wonderful. I get to give it to my friends uh, when, uh, when I have extra. Uh, and uh, it just it attaches me to the land in a, in a, in a way almost nothing else does. You, the bees... If it rains too much or blows too much, I've got to feed them because they're going to starve. And uh, okay. and also they're they're their own people, you know, their own not people, but their own. They they're not interested in us as human beings. They're not like people think bees will sting you. They have no interest in. They're vegetarians. <laughs> the only time they will ever sting you is if you actually take their hive apart, which is tricky, and then you have to have a bee suit. But you can sit. I sit in the bee in the bee yard all the time, in shorts and bare arms, bare legs, and the bees land on my naked knee and just, they're not interested in, in, in me. And, and, and re realizing how complex and amazing the planet is, that's what they help me understand. You don't sell your honey, you just do it as a hobby. Yes, it's just a hobby. What advice do you have for people who want to start beekeeping? Um... Think a lot about, if you're in Cape Breton, about where you're going to put your hives, uh, especially in, if you're in, in my part, which is North Inverness, because they, they can't tolerate too much wind. And I have, in Granite Tang, as everybody knows, you've got more wind. You can. So I spent probably two years thinking about where I would put them and setting it up. And I put them in a little gully, which is about 10 feet deep on my property. And on three sides, I have a... Um, uh, 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 a, a, a bit of a, a cliff, and then two two grand a word for it. But and then on the fourth side, I built a very robust wind fence, about ten feet high, we anchored with telephone poles, and uh, it's uh, so the the bees when they come out of their hive, they are thoroughly protected. They the wind will not they they, they so it gives them a chance to come out, test the weather, and if it's really bad, they can go back in the hive and be safe. 
you, you don't. You, so I would say if you're thinking about doing bees, great, do it. But make sure you really think hard about where you're going to put your, your your hives. Just don't do it in a casual way as if you were in Ontario. It's not going to work. Okay. There seems to me to be a real decline in wild bees. I hear farmers say, well, we don't have enough bees. We can't get bees. So they go out and they have people who are beekeepers commercially come and bring their hives to their farms so that they can uh, pollinate their, their plants and their flowers at the, under blossoms, etc. Why do you think that is? Well, I, I, I'm not sure it's true. Uh, we, we don't have enough bees for industrial farming. If, you're, if you've got 100 acres of cranberry bushes or, or almonds or whatever, you know, there probably are not enough local bees to, to pollinate your, your plants. Or, but, but if you're a normal, an old-fashioned farmer and have a small, you know, blueberry yard and small, uh, a small cranberry bog and, you know, there's plenty of bees. But uh, the industrial level, I think one-third of all the bees in the United States are in Northern California in the spring to pollinate the, the almond trees, you know, and uh, uh, you can't do it any other way. So, so I, don't, I, don't, I guess I don't agree with them. Okay. Before we wrap up, have you got any comments to make about life in general, the environment in particular? In what? In the environment in particular. Um, about life in particular, as I feel charmed and, and, and lucky to be having a healthy, healthy, wonderful life with, with friends and, and, and things that, that, that light my soul. Um, what else? Uh, just... Uh, I can't, I no longer think that I can change the world, so I, I don't try, so uh, I won't answer the second part of the question. Okay. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for coming to talk to our listeners this morning. We really appreciate it. You lead an interesting grandfather life. Thank you. And we wish you well with that, and with your writing, and avoid those bee stings. I will. I'll do my best. Thank you for listeners as well. And a reminder to hit the like and subscribe button so you can stay up to date. And remember, subscribing to Highland Waves is free. Our quote for today is by Albert Camus, who said, The purpose of a writer is to keep civilization from destroying itself. So long for now, Pat. <laughs>